I'm just going to talk about how we go about um, evaluating, exploring, and therapizing uh, children with uh, epilepsy that's surgically relevant. Um, Drug-resistant epilepsy. Let me just minimize this. One second here. There we go. So in North America, about one out of 100,000 children are diagnosed each year with epilepsy. Um, and epilepsy affects between 0.5 and 1% of the population. So if we take the fact that there are about 73 million kids in the United States in 2021, um, we can assume that there are about 1.5 million drug-resistant epilepsy pediatric patients out there. Um, medications will work a lot of the time, almost 66% of the time, two-thirds of the percent of the time. 50% um, of seizures will be controlled uh, by a first anti-seizure medication. 15% will be controlled by a second one if the first one is insufficient. Uh, but after two anti-seizure medications, the chance of seizure control drops significantly. So um, about 15 to 30% of children with epilepsy will be pharmacoresistant. And until maybe like a decade ago, maybe a little longer, I mean, the, the trial was in 2001, the really pivotal trial, we'll talk about that in a second, but um, it's been a long time coming. The paradigm has shifted. It used to be that if you had drug-resistant epilepsy, it was just a bummer. Um, um, then we had the vagal nerve stimulator, and that was helpful. But um, for a long time, and then only recently in a widespread manner, um, drug-resistant epilepsy became surgical epilepsy. And so the, the paradigm, even though the original work was done, you know, really in the 1900s um, with Victor Horsley, um, it was done in a very few centers and it was a very esoteric part of neurosurgery. Um, and in the last decade, in the last 20 years, we've seen a real pivot in this paradigm. And now drug resistant epilepsy is thought of as a surgical disease. Um, and it's shifting and it's not shifted. So the evidence for the benefit of surgical intervention is clear. We'll do a couple of landmark studies in a second. Um, but it's still the case that the time between seizure onset and surgery is about nine years average in pediatric patients, um, which is a, a pretty long time. Um, and seven to eight anti-seizure medication trials are usually uh, have been implemented um, before referral to a surgical, uh, let's say a comprehensive uh, epilepsy center. Um, reasons for the delay include um, a lot of times kids just don't get the diagnosis of epilepsy. Uh, there's just a delay in referring to the epilepsy center that's otherwise un unspecified. Um, some practitioners will sort of believe that, that epilepsy can be outgrown, um, and some can, but many, many cannot. Um, continued medication trials with low likelihood of success. There's still a very um, strong tendency among some practitioners to just keep trying medications. Um, lack of findings on imaging. Um, and it is the case that if you don't really have a lesion on MRI, uh, that the likelihood of seizure improvement and seizure freedom go down, but it is not zero. Like it is actually still pretty substantial, 40, 50%. Um, external patient factors. So people are reluctant to have surgery. They may be difficult, travel issues, stuff like that. Um, this is the really big paper I mentioned from 2001, a randomized controlled trial of surgery for temporal lobe epilepsy. And this group found that in temporal lobe epilepsy, surgery is superior to prolonged medical therapy. Randomized trials of surgery for epilepsy are feasible and appear to yield precise estimates of treatment effects. So I mean, superior to prolonged medical therapy, which is, I mean, that's actually a really helpful nugget to think about when um, you have a child, um, perhaps with a lesion, who's very well controlled on a single or two medications. Um, you know, you have to think that you know if there's a very high chance that that lesion can be removed in a pediatric patient, even if they're well controlled on anti-seizure medications, if the functional deficit of removing that lesion is low enough, you're essentially trading off 
uh, long-term medical therapy for no, no surgery. Um, and I would argue not that surgery is necessarily the better option, but that people should know that it is an option so they can decide for themselves. Uh, in children, 2017, an article, Surgery for Drug-Resistant Epilepsy in Children, and a single center trial, children and adolescents with drug-resistant epilepsy who had undergone epilepsy surgery had significantly higher rate of freedom from seizures and better scores with respect to behavior and quality of life than those who continued medical therapy alone for 12 months. Surgery did result in anticipated neurologic deficits. And we'll touch on that a little bit at the end, but you know, we're really doing two things when we're doing a seizure evaluation for surgery. We're trying to figure out where this, what is the smallest amount of brain we can get rid of that will get rid of the seizures. And if we do that, what is the likely functional deficit of doing so? And that is always the equation. So if a patient has drug-resistant epilepsy, they really should be referred to an epilepsy center. Um, the, you know, it, it, is a, it is a prolonged, highly technical, multifactorial and interdisciplinary effort. And it's not easy to achieve that. Um, you know, thankfully here, I think with the support of the, the Norton Children's Hospital, we've really been able to do that. Um, one of the first things that um, they check is, is it real? drug-resistant epilepsy. A lot of times the kids have been trialed on medications, but those medications have actually been pretty inappropriate for their actual diagnosis. So, so there's, a, there's a, an attempt to, to see if, you know, do we, do we maybe miss the boat here a little bit? Um, and if that just doesn't work, then our job is to define the epileptogenic zone, right? And that's really the phase of, a, that's the start of a phase one evaluation. Um, phase one is non-invasive. That's all it really means. So the goal of phase one is to define the epileptogenic zone as precisely as possible without making any cuts in the patient's skin or, or maybe only minor ones with a, with a needle for an IV. Um, the epileptogenic zone is, with, is, the, is the part of the brain without which none. Um, that is, if we can get rid of that, that means the seizures will be gone durably. Um, you know, the, the next zone outside the epileptogenic zone is the ictal onset zone. So where a seizure starts is not necessarily, you know, what, what part of the brain is necessary to start the seizure is not necessarily the part of the brain that's necessary um, to really make that seizure happen. Um, there's a symptomatogenic zone, um, and that can vary. It can be far away from the epileptogenic zone. It can be incorporated in the epileptogenic zone. It's highly complicated. Uh, and then the irritative zone um, outside is you know, some of the residual effects of the seizure. Um, core to any surgical epilepsy evaluation is the video EEG. Um, a 23 minute snapshot EEG is, you know, is just like a snapshot. There's a lot of information, but it only gives you one brief look at what was happening in the child's head. And video EEG is done over several days. Because it's videotaped, we can get a correlation. We can see what is she doing? What is the semiology? What is she actually doing in this seizure? And how do we line that up with our EEG findings to better understand what might be happening here in the network. Um, and uh, it can offer some localization um, and lateralization, um, but it's not great. Uh, it turns out that burying the brain underneath CSF, dura, skull, and scalp uh, really attenuates the kinds of signal we can see. Uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and there's actually a big engineering effort to take this scalp EEG information and turn it into localizable data. It's actually a very, very hard mathematical problem. Um, and it can also confirm electroclinical epilepsy versus you know, seizure in the mix, which I would argue is important if you're contemplating surgery. Um, we also get a 3T epilepsy protocol MRI, a very extensive data set. Um, and you can see here, you know, 1.5 is on the left. And, you know, one may or may not pick that up while scrolling through the coronal images here. But I'll tell you on that 3T, it really pops. So the 3T versus the 1.5T yielded additional diagnostic information in 48% of cases. Uh, and in 37.5%, that changed clinical management. Um, uh, it is definitely the case that clinical management, that is why this is such an interdisciplinary multi-layered process is because all of the layers matter and they really need to be appreciated from different angles. Um, and 3T is an important part of that. Um, and every once in a while, that's good enough. You do a video EEG and you, you, know, you get a, you get a uh, 
You get a good MRI that shows a lesion here in the left temporal lobe. Um, so previously healthy males started to have anxiety attacks in the summer of 2021, then started having eye twitching. Both sides with slight head tilt to the left and would take a few breaths and then would, wouldn't respond. So an altered mental status. Um, it was initially happening daily or every other day, and now it's happening multiple times a day. So he came to the emergency department on uh, April 26th. Um, and so he's got this lesion. The EEG says, wow, it seems to be coming from this lesion. And so we modeled it. Those are blood vessels. Um, I don't know if you can see. I apologize. My cursor's not really wanting to work. Um, those are in the white uh, in, in the front underneath the frontal lobes is the optic nerves. Uh, and that purple blob is the lesion. So we took that lesion and we modeled it by literally painting it in. And then we developed two trajectories to stick laser ablation catheters uh, into the lesion. And here's the post-op. So the red is the lesion and the yellow is what we burned. Um, and so this gives us a sense of how much volume of that um, lesion uh, was obliterated. Um, he has been, to my knowledge, seizure-free since then, then, and he went home, I think, post-op day one or post-op day two. It was, you know, the lovely thing about the laser catheters, you can get a lot of stuff done, and there are only two small holes in the head, uh, and it's really not so bad an experience. Um, but usually, video EEG and MRI is not sufficient. It's just not enough information for us to localize the epileptogenics. So what do we do? So we do a bunch of stuff, right? We get a bunch of stuff. And the more that these different modalities concord with the same spot, the higher the probability of seizure freedom, right? So we get positron emission tomography, right? So we give radio tracers and it basically is a measure of the metabolic activity of an area. And then it's compared to a statistical map of like 150 patients. So like a normalized, like this is what this voxel should be. And if it's significantly above or below, we get a little picture here. And both hypo and hypermetabolism are potential significance. Hypometabolism has been more widely used, but you know, you, you dig a little deeper in the literature, and it's pretty clear that hypermetabolism on PET can also be significant with localization. Uh, we can do a magnetoencephalogram, right? And that's like it's a super sensitive EEG. And we, you know, and it's not really an EEG. There's no electrodes on your scalp. But instead of electrodes on your scalp, they've got these sensors in this contraption, and they basically very sensitively read those brain waves uh, without any interference from the scalp, skull, and meninges. Increasingly, this is seen as a modality that is pivotal to uh, generating adequate stereo uh, EEG plans. They are very important for local localization of where you want to be looking um, for seizures with your limited electrodes. Uh, and then on the functional side, um, one thing we can do is get a functional um, MRI, uh, measures brain activity by detecting changes in blood flow, uh, and we can map uh, functional areas of interest. In fact, there's some recent work out of Seattle where they're um, doing memory paradigms. So the, the whole idea of an fMRI is you're sitting in an fMRI and we're just asking you to do stuff. You know, you know, can you feel my touch on your calf? Can you, can you twitch your finger? Can you, you know, what do you think of this sentence? Finish this sentence, like all kinds of different things. They're all called paradigms. So you sit in fMRI and you do these paradigms and different spots of your brain light up. Um, and that can be very helpful. So this group out of Seattle did these memory paradigms and they, um, they found that they could accurately and, surgical, and with surgical relevance tell you where memory function was in the temporal lobe, which until very recently really needed to be done by, you really needed to make sure memory was on one side or the other by literally putting half the, the brain to sleep. You do a WADA test, you do an angiography and you squirt uh, some kind of um, medicine into the brain. I can't remember what it's called. And you put the brain to sleep. And if the memory still works, then you know the memory's on the other side. Um, so the traditional refractory epilepsy conference takes all of these images. Um, you can see that picture uh, on the left of your screen. Those are all that. So we're like, you know, in traditional refractory epilepsy, they look at all these images and they sort of concord the, the anatomical um, and pathological information in their heads. And they, and they talk about it in a conference uh, and then they come up with either therapy or, or a phase two invasive. Um, at our institution, we do it a little differently. We take these multiple images and we actually build a model. Um, and that model, um, so what you're looking at here, the purple blob 
um, is a, a very high statistically significant pet hypometabolism. The green dots are uh, the magnetoencephalography uh, information. Uh, and the red tract there um, is actually the residual scar from, um, from where he was hit in the head with a nail gun, which was uh, operatively removed by Will. Um, and so that's the tract. That is the gliotic tract, which we actually, I mean, and you could see our um, EEG, uh, SEEG place, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we really thought that that was the culprit. Uh -huh. And then we build this model and we talk about this sort of co-registered information, and then we talk about it, and then we decide on um, whether um, it's time for therapy or phase two or just a, a, palliative, um, a palliative option. So, um, and sometimes, just like with the video EG and the MRI, sometimes phase one evaluations are sufficient to adequately localize the EZ. Um, but if not, and the phase one data does not suggest that we are never going to find this easy, uh, or it's too costly to get rid of the easy, even if you find it, the patient will proceed to phase two, which is invasive monitoring. Now we have to put a cut in the kid's skin. So the first part of our process is to build a multimodal model, right? And so this allows for anatomically precise co-registration of multiple layers of data. Uh, and we can completely tailor the stereo EEG implant to um, all of this aggregate knowledge. So we've got all of this co-registered um, radiographic information. Uh, and, then, um, and then the neurologists come because they've known the patient for a long time. Um, they have spent a lot of time thinking about the implications of what a patient does during uh, a seizure. And they've spent a lot of time looking at EEGs and thinking about what that means. So in addition to the multimodal model, the neurologists come and they say, okay, I think based on the semiological uh, and, and scalp PEG information along with this model, this is where we want our um, electrodes. Um, and then I come behind them and say, well, you know, some of these look great and then some of these you can't do that. And so we have to do something different. This was actually very close. We, um, we really sort of just, all I did was make sure we, we took the, the least risky path uh, to, to get from entry to target. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of how we generate a stereo EEG plan. Um, and then we, um, let me see what time it is. Okay. Um, and then based on the phase one, the phase two data, we think about surgical therapy. We, we, what, what can we do for this kid? And that inherently will balance the chance of seizure freedom um, against probability slash degree of functional deficit. Um, and that's the, the, that is the ongoing trade-off. It is always, that is always what it is. Sometimes it's very easy. It's a, a prefrontal lesion on the right side and the kid's two years old and that's just easy, right? You know, but what do you do if it's you know, terrible epilepsy coming from the temporal lobe, um, but it's dominant for you know, language and memory, well, then you can't take it out. Um, there's no quality of life there, right? But, but now you can stick an RNS in it. You can stick a responsive neural stimulator, which is sort of like a pacemaker for the brain. And, and that's an excellent way to modulate seizures without having to incur functional deficit. Uh, and here's a general sense of who gets what. So if you've got drug-resistant epilepsy, uh, and your onset is generalized, uh, and then we can do an RNS. Increasingly, we can do, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we can do a VNS. That has been the workhorse for this type of patient for probably 20 years. Uh, but increasingly, we can also do a responsive neural stimulator uh, or a deep brain stimulator. They're, they seem to be about equivalent, although we're just starting to take a look at this. Uh, and if you uh, stick the electrodes in the thalamus, you can control a good number of very generalized, very bad epilepsies uh, to very good effect. Um, and you can also do something called corpus, cal corpus callosotomy, uh, which is great for you know, patients with, uh, with uh, drop attacks. They just go limp and fall. Um, if, uh, if, but if it's focal, then, then you can think about localizing. Um, and if you could localize it well, you do a resection, you just take that bit of the brain out. Uh, if it's a larger chunk, but not the whole hemisphere, um, you can do like a disconnection lobectomy. If it's if it involves the whole hemisphere, you can disconnect the hemisphere, a hemispherotomy. Uh, and then ablation, which is really just resection, but that's just done with a laser catheter. You don't, you know, if it's certainly like for a selective amygdala hippocampectomy, Almost no one now does them open anymore. They almost all get done with a, 
with a laser catheter. So um, ablation is an option. Um, and um, you can also get RNS uh, or DBS um, for more focal uh, epilepsies as well, especially RNS is really uh, catching on very quickly and um, seems to be very, very effective. Um, that's all I have. I don't know if we're doing any questions or anything like that.